Welcome to the recorded version of Hospital to Home Preparation for Seniors, part of the Family Caregiver Support webinar series brought to you by the American Society in Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. We have uh, two main presenters today. Kathy Ponder is a registered nurse and certified care transitions coach and trainer working in the case management department for the St. Joseph Mercy Health System of Michigan. Kathy has been employed by St. Mary Mercy since 2005 and has received certificate awards for successful completion of the care transitions intervention coach training program as well as the train the trainer module of the care transitions program under the direction of Dr. Eric A. Coleman. Kathy currently holds a full-time position as the transition support team lead. We also want to welcome today Glenna Euro, who is a graduate of Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where she received a Bachelor of Science degree in physical therapy. Glenna worked for 20 years in a variety of healthcare settings to include an acute care hospital, skilled nursing facility, home health care agency, and sports medicine clinic. In 2001, she graduated with her MBA in Entrepreneurial Management from Davenport University, and in June 2002, she opened her Home Instead Senior Care Franchise Office in Livonia, Michigan. We are also going to be having Erin Albers from Home Instead Senior Care on the line for the Q&A session when we get to that portion at the end of the web seminar. But at this time, I want to welcome our two main presenters to the floor, Glenna and Kathy. Welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is Kathy, and first of all, I'd like to thank Steve and Erin and Glenna for inviting me to participate and um, look forward to this presentation and hope we can all support each other and our patients in their care transitions. So to start with, we'll look at the objective slide. So um, the purpose of, of today is to look at review reasons people are readmitted to the hospital, identify steps to help people who are discharged from hospital to make a successful transition home so they avoid readmission, and also so we can support our patients as active, valuable partners in their health care. We're going to also discuss some of the resources that we use and talk about a few patient-centered tools that can assist our patients. So you'll hear me reference um, the Coleman model. That's what I was trained in. That's not the only one out there. But there are some very common tools in most models, which is a patient-centered program and using Show Me, Tell Me. Um, next slide, please. So high readmission rates of hospitals are not new, and this is pretty much the excitement that's really driving care transitions. The high rates of hospital readmissions have been a challenge for decades. According to analysis of Medicare data by the Dartmouth Atlas Project, published by the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation in its report, the Revolving Door, a report on U.S. hospital admissions in February this year has been little progress when it comes to reducing readmissions. Overall, improvement has been slow and inconsistent. In the words of the report writers, as well as in this table, the readmission rate for Medicare patients in hospital for a medical condition as opposed to surgery was 15.9 in 2004, and that's what it was in 2010. And really what drove our program in our hospital, we looked at CHF, acute MI, and pneumonia, which were our main um, readmitters, and what we could do to help, those, help support those patients in our readmission. Next slide, please. And one thing that we found out, you can see from this slide right here, readmission rates vary across the country. Again, quoting Dartmouth researchers, they found that people with similar illnesses face different odds yeah, different odds of being readmitted, depending on where they live and what hospital they go to. For example, the readmission rate for a patient discharged after a medical admission in Bronx, New York, but only 11.4% in Utah. So I have a quick story, and I'm a big storyteller. Um, I did a presentation in Chicago a couple years ago, and I was talking to a group of physicians from Iowa. And they were saying, oh, we need to work on our readmission rates. They want us to come up with a program. And they were talking about what we were doing. And um, I, he said, well, we really don't have that many people who are being readmitted, but we're going to look at it. And I said, well, let's talk, talk about your patients. Who are they? And um, he said, they're farmers. I said, farmers? So when you think about a farmer, and he said, the other thing, they go to their primary care doctor's appointments, and when they get sick, they come in for help. When we look at our populations and you look at farmers, they need to be healthy and they need to remain healthy to, um, to work on their farms. So 
So again, it's, it's very important that we look at the populations we serve as we develop programs to help re reduce readmissions. Next slide. And as we come up with these plans for each one of us to look at readmissions and also support our patients as they move across the care continuum, it's very obvious to know that readmissions are very complex and not all readmissions are avoidable. So why do patients come back within 30 days of being discharged? Again, this question is very complex and there is not just one answer. Some patients come back for scheduled treatment. I have a patient I'm seeing now, he came in with an exacerbation of CHF. He's 93 and he's telling me, I'm getting ready to go for my knee replacement in two weeks. So I'm working with him, is he really ready for that surgical treatment. He's telling me in the past month he hasn't felt good. So I worked with him and his family to put together a journal on how he's been feeling for the last month, prepared to meet with his primary care doctor after his hospitalization to tell them what's really been going on. Um, and so scheduled treatments are important, important. Another thing, patients are just too weak to have all treatments at once. And I know we all have information on length of stay. Sometimes patients are discharged and they may need a colonoscopy, especially on our elderly um, population. They may do a prep for a, um, for a, class, or for a um, colonoscopy, and that may cause a readmission based on dehydration. Some people have a new illness or accident. It's not unusual for especially people with COPD to develop some heart failure or an exacerbation, a new diagnosis of heart failure and then they do readmit. Another very common thing we have, um, and again, I focus a lot on heart failure, pneumonia, and acute MI. Some of our patients with heart failure, they come in. They're used to being very independent at home. They're in bed for three to five days. Maybe they did or did not have physical therapy. And as healthcare providers, we're watching them in the room. They get up and go to the bathroom. Oh, they're pretty steady. Things are looking good. But how far do they really have to walk when they're home and again, we look at patients who go to assisted livings and we think, well, they'll have help, they'll be okay. And actually, they may have to walk, you know, several hundred feet to get to their meals. So are we looking at that? Are we looking at getting physical therapy with them, helping them move around a little bit before they go to see where they are according to their baseline? Another important complex, very complex readmissions is also area hospitals used as a site for care. Not only can they be used as a site for care for treatment, patients coming back, but I've also had a few patients who the hospital has actually been identified by them as their community support. So if you look at a patient who's had a few readmissions, spending a little time with them and talking to them, being present with them, Finding out why they're coming back, not just are they labeled non-compliant. One gentleman we had turns out he was alone. So really he was coming back and when we picked him up, he had about seven admissions to our hospital and he really was coming for support. He had no one, he was fed here, he was cared for, he laughed and he really felt, you know, again, that people were here for him. So helping support this patient in the community and not to use the hospital as a site of care was very important. And another interesting fact for our seniors, I had one of my patients, she had it down to a science. She knew exactly how sick she had to get before she called the ambulance, so the ambulance would be covered, she would be admitted, and she would not have to involve her kids in her care and give them a break. So these are all very important things to think about you know, as we look at programs to help reduce readmissions, what's really behind them. Next slide. So what's really going on? So patients are being readmitted as a fragmented system and the care too often leads our discharged patients to their own devices. They are unable to follow instructions, they don't even understand them and they're not taking medications or getting necessary follow-up care. These are two of the main reasons for readmissions, medication management and getting our patients to their primary care. Another term I use for this that we have found in our program is actually health literacy, working with our patients to find out 
that they are struggling with health literacy. Next slide. So drivers of avoidable readmissions. Many patients are discharged without understanding their illness, or patients with con chronic conditions may pose a particular challenge. So again, we're talking here about health literacy. Do they really understand what's going on? Has someone spent time with them to go over their discharge instructions? More importantly, does the patient feel comfortable asking someone about their discharge instructions? And of course, patients with chronic conditions pose many particular challenges, as I just stated earlier. If they are admitted for congestive heart failure or COPD, are they really strong enough to return home? Are we working with them and our case managers to make sure the next level of care is appropriate to treat them and support them in their care continuum? Next slide. So here's a story about Barbara, and this kind of gives us a nice, um, kind of, again, a good story that helps us understand what's going on. So Barbara was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 1998, and we're going to look at the um, gaps in her care. So she's a 44-year-old woman. She lives in New York with her husband and four children. She has worked as a child care provider for the past 10 years and is in dealing with a lot of health issues. She has type 2, di type 2 diabetes and says it has caused nerve damage and constant pain. She also suffers from sleep apnea, high cholesterol, and thyroid disease. And you can see now we have a lot of comorbidities. Although diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 1998, Barbara has large gaps in her knowledge about diabetes management. And this surfaced when she was hospitalized a year ago. Again, we're talking about health literacy. She says not once did she recall having a serious discussion about her diet with her primary care provider. She explained that she went to the emergency room when her blood sugar reached 500. She did not call her doctor first because it was too late in the evening and she figured he would not answer. Barbara was admitted to the hospital and stayed for two days. She said that doctors in the hospital gave her saline through an IV insulin and put her on a diabetes meal plan. They took her blood sugar count three times a day. Barbara's primary care doctor visited her during the hospital stay. Her emergency room doctor had asked her who her primary care was and contacted him. And you can just imagine how overwhelming this must be for Barbara to answer all these questions and keep them organized. The primary care doctor told Barbara to make an appointment once she was discharged so she could develop a new care plan. After two days, the doctor, the doctor developed a new care plan and she was discharged home. Barbara questioned whether she had been discharged too soon. She said the discharge process from the hospital was not as detailed as she would like. She explained that her hospital doctor stopped by her room and told her to watch what she eats and that everything was under control now. She said a nurse gave her a little more detail, like no sugars, no soda, no candy, no sweets. Barbara wanted more information and to maybe speak to a nutritionist, but she trusted her doctor and went home. Once home, Barbara contacted her primary care doctor to make office to make an appointment but she was told the earliest opening was a month away. Even after explaining she had just been discharged from the hospital, she could not get an earlier appointment. Barbara was fine for the first day and a half, but then started having terrible headaches. She checked her blood sugar and found it was 700, a number she said is dangerously high. Barbara explained that she panicked, as she had never seen that before. She hopped in a taxi and went straight back to the hospital. The second hospital stay lasted two weeks, so you can see she's much more ill now. During the second visit, Barbara was given a new kind of insulin. Her doctor told her body had become accustomed to the old insulin and she needed to change her dose. Her hospital doctor also recommended that she start seeing the endocrinologist since she had multiple chronic health conditions in addition to her diabetes. No one had told her this before. Barbara also met with a nutritionist, something she had wanted during her initial stay, 
and learned during the consultation that many of the foods she was eating were bad for her, like white rice. <clears throat> After two weeks, Barbara was feeling better and ready to go home. Once home, she finally had her appointment with her primary care doctor. It was her primary care doctor who taught her how to adjust her insulin amounts and instructed her on how to correctly inject insulin. She thinks if she knew this information before, she could have possibly avoided the readmission. Next slide. Next slide. Barbara's story. Barbara's story provides us with a great example of how a lack of understanding and health literacy of her condition of the steps she needed to take at home about diet and exercise can lead to a readmission. <clears throat> and this is very important. As I discussed about health literacy earlier, once I started looking into that term, I realized what does that really mean? So if, I, if something was wrong with my car and I went to the auto dealer, I would have <clears throat> auto literacy. I'm trusting the person who's fixing my car to know that I probably don't understand everything going on and to find the terms and the words to use that I'm understanding and also that they're going to stop at some point in that and say, do you understand? Watching how I'm responding to everything and even if I'm asking questions. So one thing we can do for someone like Barbara is make sure we're present with her when she's in the emergency room. That is the first touch point of the care, con care continuum. And also when she's in the hospital, every health care provider that meets with her try to be present and ask her what's important to her. She may actually have had some instruction on diabetes and some of her medication, but if she's overwhelmed and not feeling well, she may not be receiving or taking in that information. So again, it's very important to stop, be present with our patients, and kind of assess what's going on. Another thing is those discharge instructions are so important. What can we do as healthcare providers to help our patients understand their discharge instructions and get them to their primary care doctor's appointment in a timely fashion? And the other thing we'll talk about as the presentation moves on, also empowering our, parent, our patients to be active in their healthcare, letting them be comfortable asking their questions and making their needs known. So in Barbara's story, you can tell her, pri so her primary care was notified and um, a very fast follow-up happened with her the next time. <clears throat> and she did feel much better prepared as she moves across the care continuum with her new diagnosis and her new insulin. Next story, or next slide, please. So medications play a big role. I'm so sure everyone listening to this knows that, again, it's probably one of the main reasons that people readmit to the hospitals, their medication management. Sometimes patients discontinue important medicines needed to stay well. Sometimes patients may not have the right prescriptions. Lack of money or insurance means sometimes people do not fill their prescriptions. They also take them differently. They cut them in half. They take them every other day. Any way they can figure out to make them last. <clears throat> and sometimes and actually most of the times, there is confusion. So when we started our program, we call this, we have a term called aha, there are aha moments. And one gentleman, <clears throat> excuse me, I saw probably within two months of my program, I went to visit him and he was very grumpy and everyone's like, oh, get Kathy, she'll come and see him. You know, he won't talk to anyone, she'll, she'll work this out. He will not have a visiting nurse, nothing to do with them. In the program that I have as a care transition coach, we see people in the hospital and then at home, and we follow them for 30 days. And the most important thing that I would share with you with this model is we develop trust. So the patient sees us in the hospital, and that's a very simple introduction. Hello, how are you? Is there anything I can get you at? And I even look, can I make him comfortable at the time? Because I've already been notified. He's also been labeled noncompliant for three to four readmissions to the hospital with heart failure, and he doesn't go to his doctor. Um, I've spoken to his doctor prior to meeting with him, so I'm able to say to Mr. B that I'm here and I know your doctor, Dr. Strilla, and we have this neat program. I can see you here in the hospital and I can come see you at home. Very little, you know, I keep it short, and before you know it, he's saying, oh, okay, you can come out, you can come see me, and 
So it's like, okay, so I set it up for the next day. So when I get into his home, and this is very common, we do home visits, I walk into his house and I call this the nest. So he's sitting in his nice, comfortable chair with his feet up, just resting by the window with a light, and on both sides of him are several sheets of paper from the hospital, at least five or six discharge instructions, and bottles of medicines on both sides. So one thing we tell, we have our patients, we use Show Me, Tell Me to learn their medication management system. So I have Mr. B show me, and I've got discharge instructions, and he pulls the discharge instructions and show me what medicines you're taking. So as he pulls each bottle, he shows it to me, and of course most of them are not on the list, and he pulls up this one bottle, and it has the word puffin on it. And I said, puffin, Mr. B, what does that mean? He said, when I'm short of breath, I take this. It was Coumadin. So this gentleman's readmissions, his noncompliance, and he was readmitted for Coumadin toxicity, is related to his even ability to manage his medicine. At this point, he's becoming engaged in this process of care transitions, and his wife is now standing behind me with a sheet of paper thinking, I have to write these down. The next thing we do is get two um, Ziploc bags and start going through his meds and putting meds he shouldn't be on in one bag, and she's writing the list. And, and how does the rest of the story go? He was actually doing very poorly at home, very weak, but he started taking his medicine, and I went to his primary care appointment with him, and he was doing much better. In fact, his daughter showed up, like, I can't believe this is my dad, and said, okay, we'll just sit here and wait. And the, the receptionist says to me as a coach, you can't come back. Too many people are here. I said, no problem. So they go in, and the doctor then sends for me and says, hey, why is Mr. B, what's, what's happening? He's doing so much better. It's not about the coach. It's about our patients. So I said to Mr. B, tell your doctor why do you think you're doing better and he said because I'm taking his medicine he's taking his medicine so he produced a list to the doctor the doctor looked at it updated it went and copied out a brand new list for this patient and words that he could see and returned it to the patient so you can see again medication management very important and I also believe that true med rec um, occurs at the primary care level so we have a very strong program that supports our patient getting back there as soon as possible. So long story on medication play, but everyone loves that story. So next slide, please. So other drivers, family members, are not part of the discharge planning. So a lot of times, sometimes we're actually talking to our patients and our caregiver may not be present who is part of that whole plan. So having the caregivers engaged is very important. A lack of coordination and communication. You've heard me talk about the term the care continuum or transitions of care, and just think about how our patients go from each level, or I call it touch point, across this care continuum. If we're not talking to each other or communicating, it makes it very difficult for our patients, and in fact, the only constant across this care continuum is our patient. So learning to empower our patients so they can tell us what their needs are at each touch point and helping them be active as well as their caregiver makes a big difference. We also need to talk to each other. Um, and there is a story I'll talk about um, later, another aha moment, as in a, one of our models, Coleman models, you empower the patient to talk to their health care providers. We actually have added at times communicating to our health care providers, working with their patients so they have the information they need as this patient moves from one touch point to the other. So coordination, 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 all of us working together really makes a difference. And the lack of clarity regarding who is responsible and identifying that for a patient is very important. A lot of times it's that primary care, getting the patient back to the primary care reviewing medication sheets when they're discharged, even when they're coming from skilled rehab, each touch point getting back to that primary care to help reconcile what's going on. And patient honesty. Patients want honesty. It's very important to them. They know when you're being honest and developing trust, again, moves that patient to being comfortable, and you'd be surprised at how easily 
they start sharing what's important to them. Next slide. So as we look at the summary of drivers, many patients feel like they're discharged too soon. That's very important to talk about, especially when you think about our senior population. Years ago, they were able to stay in the hospital. They went in when they didn't feel too good, not that bad, and they really stayed until they felt good enough to go home. So some patients want to go right home. Others want to stay until they're feeling perfect because they live alone. So a lot of patients do feel like they're discharged too soon. So we need to support them that if they're in the hospital, this is the level of care you're at right now that you need. And as they're ready to move to the next level, helping support them so they understand the next level is going to occur, but we're here to help you and be with you so you're successful at each touch point or as they move across this care continuum. Many patients do not understand their discharge instructions. This is a huge aha moment for um, our program. They had looked at one time, they had changed some of our discharge instructions. These are the meds you used to take, these are the meds you're taking now, and these are the ones to check with your doctors. If you give a patient that, they are so confused because they don't know actually which medication list they should be looking at. So all of us listening as healthcare providers, what can we do as you look at discharge instructions to make them simpler for patients? And if they can't be, use a highlighter, staple your discharge instructions. One of the nurses, um, I call her one of our nurse champions, she uses a highlighter. So she'll highlight on their discharge instructions, and I can almost guarantee that I will find her discharge instructions in the home because she's engaged with the patient in those discharge instructions. Sometimes care instructions can be too general. So does a patient actually need more information about their heart failure or COPD or their new diagnosis? Patients and caregivers not assertive enough. Of course, I just talked about that as very important in almost every model to address um, readmissions will be a very patient-centered model in empowering that patient to share their needs. But again, you need to be present with them. You need to develop trust so they're comfortable sharing that information. Getting to know your patients is very important. We talk about there's a patient's goal or actually what's important to them. And once you find that out, the conversation goes pretty easily. Um, some of my patients, we had a patient with two or three readmissions to the hospital, not just ours, but another one. And they're like, ah, you can go see her. And she's also a little bit difficult to deal with. And I go to visit her in her home and she just has this nice house in Livonia as you drive by. And as I walk into her home, it's almost like a museum. Come to find out, she's a science teacher. As we continue to talk, she says, hey, do you want to see my garden? So I go out into her backyard, which has also been authorized as a um, natural habitat, which I'm sure there's like four or five of those, if that, in southeastern Michigan. And the amount of birds flying around her garden would be like a butterfly garden that I've seen. That is what's important to her, and that giving her that chance to talk to me about that was then able, she was able to share with me about her medicines, and you know what she said? I really cannot get to the doctors. I have no one to get me there. So again, spending some time to get to know some of these patients and what they're about can move them in that direction, they, there's trust established, and they're going to start talking to you about um, what's important to them and then be able to get their needs met. New diagnoses pose special challenges. Just had a patient the other day, several admissions for COPD. Now he has CHF. He is overwhelmed. So again, it will be very important to support him as he moves from one level of care to the next, helping him understand about heart failure how to manage that, and more importantly, who to ask questions, set him up with home care to support his care in the home, and also his continued learning on heart failure. Primary care physicians missing the pictures. More and more primary care physicians are getting on board, um, getting their patients in after they're discharged from the hospital within um, two weeks for sure, and also maybe setting up some physicians have care managers now working with their patients once they've been discharged from the hospital. Do they understand their discharge instructions and what is important to them as they move forward? 
Limited or no support once at home, this is a big issue for our senior population. And a lot of them, if you ask them at the bedside, will tell you exactly what you want to hear. So the case manager says, um, do you live alone? Yes. Yeah. Do you have someone to help you? Yes. Do you have someone to get you to your doctor's appointments? Yes. Are you going to get your medicines on the way home? Yes. And they're going to say yes to all of those. Once we get out to the home, they had no intention whatsoever to get to their doctor, nor means of transportation, and some of them have not filled their meds for financial reasons, and they really have no one to get their meals. So developing programs and support systems for our patients with downstream providers will make a big difference, and we need to all work together in communities to help support our patients. But first, again, we have to be able to move with our patients and help them trust us so they'll tell us what their needs are. Um, number eight, some were not ready to change behaviors, and this happens quite a bit. And again, that's where um, understanding their goals and what's important to them is very important to help them change their behaviors. Lack of education about their illness, health literacy, very important. Confusion about follow-up care. So getting to our patients after their discharge to help them understand what they need to do is very important. Next slide. Next. So Care About You, um, I really encourage you to take a look at this video and um, also look at the report. It's very helpful and it also talks about experts in the field and different programs that um, you can look at if you're, if you're looking at developing programs to deal with care transitions. Next slide. Next slide. Patients and caregivers, very important slide. We're going to talk about that this supports our patient and actually a patient experience. I just did a presentation last week. All of these on this slide have to do with the patient's experience in the hospital. And again, I can't stress how important it is to be present when we're working with our patients. Listen to our patients and their caregivers to find out what's important to them. Length of stay is a some caregivers want patients to stay longer till they get things ready at home. Very important to talk about that. What is the extent of the illness? And knowing what he or she will not be able to do. I work with a lot of my caregivers as I'm there with the patient. What do you need your husband to be able to do to bring him home? She needs to tell him that. We need to get physical therapy on board. What level of care will best support this patient? Dietary concerns, very important. Nutrition and dietary, very important. Get them involved with any of your heart failure patients, diabetes, and our elderly populations. They actually really want to learn. We have to give them the opportunity and permission to learn. Medication or medical equipment, talking to our patients about their medicine at the bedside in their terms, getting some specialists. Do you have a pharmacist at your hospital or health system that can work with them? get them at the bedside, and what medical equipment will help our patients be independent and support them in their next level of care. Also important, I tell my patients, if they have to have medical equipment, it helps them be independent. A lot of elderly people, I don't want that, then I'm old. So we work with them on what we need to be independent. Follow-up care required, warning signs, very important, often addressed on the discharge instructions. We use a personal health care record to help our patients identify their warning signs and what the response is. One gentleman would say, I'm, you know, his wife, you're short of breath. No, I'm not short of breath. So I'll ask him, how do you feel? I feel full like a cup of coffee. That is his warning sign. That one warning sign he had for heart failure matched the traditional one. So asking our patients, show me, tell me, tell me how you feel, show me how you feel, and help them document that. Next slide. So caregivers. Also, we need to support our caregivers. I kind of addressed that in the previous slide, making sure their needs are met too and that they're able to get what they need prior to the patients coming home. Next slide. I know time's an issue. <laughs> Next slide. So when is home care needed? And um, another term we use that we have found an aha moment is we talk about handover versus handoff. So we're working with our healthcare providers to hand over to them, and now I'm going to hand it over to Glenna, 
who's going to talk about home care. Thank you, Kathy. Well, it's very important to identify when home care is needed and really what services are going to be most beneficial. And we know today frequently that both of the adult children or spouses are working. So oftentimes this is going to lead the patient to navigating their own, their own care. And home care associations and organizations can assist with many different phases of this process. When we talk about discharge coordination, there's so much that goes on, Kathy's talked about, the follow-up tests, procedures, doctor's appointments. You know, she mentioned the, the discharge instructions. I think one of the first challenges when we get into the home is locating those discharge instructions. And then certainly step two is getting that coordination of all of these different things that are mentioned in those instructions so they can get to the important places at the right time. Kathy also mentioned medication monitoring, that med reconciliation. We see over and over again that they just have that trust in their primary care physician. So they come home with all these prescriptions, and they're hesitant to fill them. And they, they kind of go through that start, stop, continue. Which ones do I start? Which ones do I stop? Which ones should I continue? The following up of doctor's appointments, we can assist with the incidental transportation to get them there. And a big piece also is coaching them through that process of calling the doctor's office and being able to take control and explain, I've been in the hospital, I'm confused with my prescriptions, I need to see the doctor right away. Coaching them through that process so they can take control of that situation the time and time again moving forward. Nutrition management, a big one, truly understanding what it means to stop the salt. You know, we, we send all these instructions home of, of no salt, but they just don't understand that, that that lunch meat, that turkey, that bread is loaded with salt. The can of, of beans in the, in the cupboard is loaded with salt. It's understanding that for them. Warning sign monitoring, we like to use the traffic sign, a red, yellow, green, and helping them to understand that you want to live in the green zone, the all clear. I don't have any shortness of breath. I'm not gaining any weight. I don't have any chest pain. But what happens when I get in the yellow zone? I'm starting to feel dizzy. I am having some discomfort. It's harder to breathe. Well, now how do I get from the yellow back to the green and not go to red? Because red is an emergency, and I'm going to then end up back into the hospital. Record keeping understanding the outcome of all these different appointments if their adult children couldn't go to the doctor with them, understanding it's not enough to go there, but, but, but what happened at that appointment and what should I do from there? And again, helping them get there with the incidental transportation. So one example of all of these types of assistance is, is a program Home Instead has called Hospital to Home. And we continue to see the most critical areas that we can help with this is the medication, the physician appointments, certainly the personal care because that leads to all kinds of other issues, and then the whole nutrition. If we could solve nutrition in the home, we could solve a, a, lot, of, a lot of problems. And we know that surgeries and illnesses and medications cause folks to lose the, the appetite, lose the taste of the food and hydration is a really big issue. And we see that time and time again because of mobility issues. It's difficult for them to get up out of the lazy boy so they don't drink enough fluids and end up, you know, back in again with issues. So we know how critical all of these factors are in the first 30 days of being home and how really important it is to establish success right, right from the get-go. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over back to Kathy. Yeah. And I'm going to accept that handover. And really what Glenna just gave a very good example of is supporting their patient, our patients at that touch point when they're in the home and helping them have everything they need. And this next slide talks about, next slide please, when patients are leaving the hospital. So what we want to do is engage them before they're leaving the hospital. If they have some type of personal health care record or something that they can document on, this is very important. And Glenna brought up something, helping them practice. We can even role play with them before they're discharged, how to talk to their doctors, how to make a list for their doctors with their most important question first. Even though they want to talk about their cats or their dogs or their kids, they really have to identify what's that most important question and put it first. Next slide. So patients and caregivers. So the first few days, we want to let our patients know they have to watch for those warning signs. And as I described earlier, what are their warning signs? Not everyone has those typical warning signs. 
record their medications taken? Do they have a med list? Has it been updated? Do they understand it? Can the family read it? Do they have a medication management system that supports that medication list? And is it posted in case of an emergency? We work with our patients and families. Have that list ready to go with their medicines on it, the name of their primary care doctor, and who that emergency contact person is. And for the first 30 days, and again, that's what our program kind of supports, is what do they need to do? They need to get to those doctor's appointments, and they may have one or two. How are they going to get there? And we want to ask them, who is the doctor you're going to see? And tell me how you're going to get there, because if you ask them, are you going to get to your doctors? They're going to say yes. Do you have transportation? Yes. We want to use show me, tell me, so we know they can get there. Also, eating well. Again, Glenna brings up a very good point. Nutrition is extremely important, and we should really add that as a fifth pillar um, as we look at medication management, red flags, getting to your doctors, and having a personal health care record. Our patients taking their medications as prescribed and help them get the outside help they need. It's not uncommon for a patient to go home and a couple days into their discharge say, okay, I really would like a visiting nurse. I do need to have home care that can support me. I need extra help. Or some patients, they may want rehab, and we're actually able to get them from home right to a rehab, preventing an emergency room admission as well as a full-blown hospital admission. But again, we've engaged the patient to share with us how we're feeling to move them to that next level of care quicker and prevent that readmission. Next slide, please. So, and these are some tips that are important to go over with your patients. They're usually, a lot of them are on their um, discharge diagnosis or their discharge instructions. Going over them is helpful, and especially the caregiver. When to call your family doctor and when to call 911, important to know. And a lot of times we tell our families that they're really not sure. Sometimes it's better to call 911. And we work with our patients, do not drive if you're not feeling well, or for a caregiver, do not drive your husband or wife or patient who's having, you know, 911 symptoms. Next slide. So resources. Again, I encourage you, encourage you to take a look at Care About Your Care and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and also Home Instead Senior Care Network is on there, Caregiver Stress and Returning Home. Some other resources, um, as I as was said in the beginning, I'm a care transition coach. That's under Dr. Eric Coleman, Care Transitions. You can learn a little bit more about my program as well. And next slide. So next step. So remember to take a look at the tip sheet for information on what families and patients should watch for. Offer information that will help them avoid readmission and stay healthy. And again, support our patients and families in becoming those active, valuable partners in their health care. Take a look at the revolving door report and share resources that provide help with strengthening the mind, body, and soul. A few other fun resources I've used in the past. There's a good book, The Art of Aging, which actually supports the mind, body, and soul. And some good movies to look at. The Greatest Marigold to the Motel or Hotel. That's a great movie for most of you to watch. It kind of helps you. There's a part in the beginning where um, she receives a phone call. She's trying to cancel her um, computer or her program, and then no one's really listening to her. She's actually hired later in the movie to train people to talk in a very patient-centered or person-centered way um, to, uh, to get their needs across. So that's a great movie to watch. And next slide, please. I know I'm watching the time. I think we have 10 minutes. So any questions, we're here to answer questions. Thank you. All right. Yes, it is time for the Q&A portion of the web seminar. And Kathy and Glenna, I want to thank you for a great presentation so far. Um, we also want to welcome Aaron Albers to the line from Home Instead Senior Care. So thanks uh, for joining us, Aaron. Welcome. Happy to be here. Okay, uh, real quick, what was the name of that movie again? A couple it's questions. It's The Greatest on Marigold. It's Motel or Hotel, and it's um, Judy Dench in the beginning. It's really, really the whole movie talks about um, really people identifying goals and what's important to them. 
and moving through, through those last stages of life. But in the beginning, actually listening to the person talking to her on the phone is a great thing to watch to see how we have an agenda. So they're talking to her, they have an agenda, and it is not their, her agenda, nor are they getting any information from her. So later in the movie, when she, they actually hire her to train people to talk, she teaches them and works with them, show me, tell me. This is how you need to talk to someone to get your needs met, understand me, and support me where I am. So it's a great movie. Benjamin Button's another good one, too. I, sorry, I was going to mention that as well. Okay, yeah, and a couple of people have written and said it's it's called the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Is that Perfect. right? Yes, that's yeah, it. Mar Mar marigold as in the uh, flower. Flower. Uh, yep, as in the flower. Yeah. Um, okay, so next question here. Can you please share where we can find the Revolving Door Report? The Revolving Door Report is actually on the website on the slide that's in here. It's If you go to the Robert Wood John Johnson, Johnson Foundation. If you go on to their, the first page of their website, you can actually pick it up. It's a full 60-page report. What I liked about it is as health systems are looking at trying to identify a transition or a care transition program to meet their patients' needs, it's important to know we all have different populations and what's going to work for one may not work for the other. The common thread in all this, though, is a patient-centered and supporting our patients as that valuable member in their health care. Did that answer your question? Yes, I believe it did. Um, can you also remind us what the other website you were referencing was besides caregiverstress.com? Um, oh, for me, I had talked about Dr. Eric Coleman Care Transitions. You may also be referring to returninghomecare.com which is Home Instead Senior Care's website for um, professionals such as yourself and resources and information on how to help families keep their loved ones at home and staying home after a hospital stay. Returninghomecare.com. Returninghomecare.com. All right, great. Um, next question here. Uh, one of my clients has been told they need to be on antibiotics prior to some dental appointments, and another d doctor in the same department says absolutely not. How can the client ask questions without creating hard feelings among the doctors who are colleagues? Um, I think what they, again, first of all, I would kind of work with a primary care doctor. They could even start with a primary care doctor. What's, what are they recommending? And if they have a tool or if they have it written down, we give them a personal health care record. If they can read it, that helps. So, you know, who has the deciding factor? Is that the dentist? or is that going to be the primary care doctor? So helping them understand who that person is that's going to make that final decision and for them to confidently say, this is what was said to me, this is what I'm going to do. Okay, um, next question here for our panel. What tips do you have for independent geriatric care managers to work with the hospital staff to create a smooth transition plan for discharge when the patient or client is admitted to the hospital? Frequently, discharge planning does not take place until the day of discharge. Can you um, talk about that a little bit? Um, so what can, can they get into the hospital? Is a, geri is a person able to get into the hospital who's asking that question? Uh, I believe they're talking about independent geriatric care managers who are working with hospital staff um, when someone's coming out of the hospital. So I believe care transition starts the second they get into the hospital. So actually, once a hospital kind of puts their arms around a care transition program, at each even touch point in the hospital, teaching those health care providers to stop and work with that patient, this is a huge I mean, this is a big cultural change. Um, you know, we've been told as we work with some of our patients, our physicians have said, not only are you coaching our patients, you're coaching us to work with our patients in a little bit different setting. Working with home care agencies, same thing, very territorial. So it's hard to answer that question unless they can get into the hospital and actually coaching each touch point or each, yeah, each touch point in that level of care in the hospital to be more patient-centered because geriatric patients need support. Some hospitals I know have geriatric units, 
and they're working with their patients in a, you know, in a whole different setting, and other hospitals are developing programs to support those geriatric patients from the second they walk in the door. Um, and I would agree with what Kathy said. Um, being on the home care side, we have some of those same challenges, but it, it begins in the hospital. And so if that patient is under their care before they go into the hospital, then making you know time to go in and visit them while they're in the hospital, because that is where that beginning of the transition of care starts. And that's the time to be able to communicate with the patient to see what parts they understand at this point, what parts they don't understand, again, keeping the, the patient in the center of this, and that allows that ability then to go direct to the case managers working on their case while they're still in the hospital. Okay. Um, coordinating with other providers is important, but can you comment on how frustrating it can be when there is a delay due to getting a release of information from signed and sent form when they're, I'm sorry, when there is a delay in getting a release of information form signed and sent? That's a challenge because we're depending on that information to cross that care continuum to help us take care of our patients. Hopefully in the future that won't be such a challenge, but again, I cannot show you how important having a patient have some type of personal health care record because again, they are the constant and they are the one that can share some of that information. We are pretty, and we're a smaller 304-bed hospital, and we have this whole care transition team going, and we're, you know, spread out to the community, and we have partners working with us. So we've been able, once you establish those are partners, can actually get our information pretty quickly. If it's not going electronically, sometimes we may even fax them, especially if we have patients who need to follow up with a physician and their primary care is not in our hospital. You know, again, this is a challenge you hope that will get better as time, as it moves forward. The patients are moving very, very quickly from one transition of care to the next, and giving them the information that they have to move help. They have discharge instructions. We're giving clinical discharge instructions now when they leave the hospital, and they can share that with their home care providers or even when they go to the rehab. We always talk about the patient being the only common denominator between every single transition of care, whether it's hospital to home, hospital to SNF, SNF back to hospital. The only common denominator is the patient. So the more we continue to focus on patient-centered and keep them in the loop and being primary communicator, then the easier it will get. Okay, um, do you have any information or tips on how to find formal caregivers, either private pay or through licensed or uh, CDPAP programs? Workforce finding is very difficult. Lena, we'll let you take that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, looking specifically for pri private, private pay as in through an agency? Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay. So working through an agency, your best resource is to always go to your medical providers because they've been established in their market as to the go-to experts, whether it's with your local hospitals, with your local um, nursing home facilities, your home health agencies. Another great resource is the Area Agency on Aging, which has got, you know, lots of background in the different agencies that are out there. But I would always start with the most credible resources. You know, it's the old, when you go to the doctor um, and you say to the doctor, if you had to have surgery, which surgeon would you pick? I look at that as the same answer when we're working in the healthcare arena. Which home care agency would you select? Okay. Um, do you have any resource models for hospital care man for hospital case managers to use to help with the care transition? Um, some of the models to look at, you know, they can look up the Coleman model um, to start with, and, and that's a very patient-centered program. And that's really where you've got transition coaches who are working from hospital to home. I'm actually where I'm part of the care, the case management pro, the case management team. So we have a case manager who sees patients and then makes referrals to the transition coach. But again, like Glenna said, it, it, you can look up, you know, for sure look up Dr. Coleman. Again, take a look at the revolving door. That report has some other resources in there as well. But they have that common denominator, everyone getting used to looking at the patient and being present with that patient and listening to them. Well, they, you'll be surprised at how much you learn. Anyone's still listening. If you try show me, tell me with your patients tomorrow, 
you'll be shocked at what you'll learn about them and also watch them come around and get engaged in what you're trying to teach them or show them. And that's where you've got a teach back, show back model. I'm sure a lot of people listening to that, that's very common. So just take that one step further, show me, tell me. Had a patient go home with oxygen, great oxygen supply company. When he was done explaining it to him, the patient was very confused, and he said, now show me how you're going to do this. So he watched her walk through the house with that. We can apply that at every level. Okay, uh, the next question. Uh, families caring for uh, seniors uh, post-discharge seem to wear out very quickly. What types of resources are available for them? I guess I can take this one. Yep. Um, again, I would recommend respite through an organized agency. Caregiver burnout, and again, I'd refer you back to caregiverstress.com, is so prevalent in the health conditions that occur in the, in the family caregivers, it, it, it's unbelievable what will happen to their own health. And so it's, it's critical that they get respite and they're going to be a, a better caregiver as a result of it. So looking for resources and most importantly, bringing in an agency and allowing some break, some break in the week, some break in the day, whatever amount that works for them so that they can be a healthier and happier caregiver. And uh, we uh, uh, little tip sent in from one of our attendees here. A good reference is CMS, your discharge planning checklist. Have you have you heard about that one? Um, yes, that's an excellent. Um, and we've looked at that. That's a great tool to use for our patients. Um, take a look at that. Very important to go through your patients at the bedside. What is the checklist? Empower them. Role play with them before they leave the hospital. Write questions. What do they want to ask their doctor? What do they want to ask about their medicines um, before they leave the hospital? That's an excellent, um, excellent tool. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, after surgery, how can hospitals help patients establish a logical sleep and wake time? Um, waking up my clients each time a shift change happens is not helping. And so how can we put more importance on sleep as opposed to another blood draw, a weight check, et cetera? Family members on visiting times have been alarmed with the lack of sleep that their family members are actually getting in the hospital. Yep, family members and caregivers. My mother-in-law's in the hospital right now. We're all exhausted as well as she is. That's a big challenge because they do need care. And, um, you know, there's a hospital I saw, they actually post, a lot of hospitals have quiet times. Um, or to keep the, the level of noise down, they may turn the lights on. Um, I'm not sure what other programs are out there, but definitely people should look at that. Um, but also remember, you know, they do need care, but are there things we can do as healthcare providers to support our patients, especially in their hospital, keep them as close to their routine as possible, if it is possible. So, and um, that's a very good question. We had a patient on, a, on our rehab unit who wanted to sleep in every day, and turned out she was a um, dancer for years and years, and she was in her 80s. So the rehab, they actually readjusted their schedule to meet her needs and allow her rest time in the morning and she was doing things later in the evening. So that's create that's being creative. So Okay, um do you have any suggestions on how to help patients who frequent the ER as opposed to going to a PCP? Um that can start in the first of all in the emergency room if you have a social worker present can um can work with the patient but they're already in the emergency room. That's really going back to the primary care. We work with a group of physicians and believe me, he wants his physician he wants his patients to call him first. We work with our patients. Again, this is care transitions. This can be discussed at discharge. This can be discussed by our physicians when they go see their when they see their patients for even their well visits. Here's a good plan. If you don't feel well, call me first. I'm here for you. I will answer what are the callback numbers. So that's educating at the primary care level what they can do to support their patients. And we do work with our patients identifying red, you know, those red flags and signs and symptoms before they get too bad. We have them document when they've been in the hospital. How did you feel this time, this time, this time? So they look at, okay, when I'm not able to walk, I've gained a couple pounds, I don't feel good, call my doctor versus waiting for the six or eight pound weight gain, very fatigued, very short of breath, 
Now you have a hospitalization for a CHF where if they would have called the doctor with a two-pound weight gain and a change in fatigue, could have been managed with an increase in Lasix and avoid the entire hospital stay. So educating our patients how to call the primary care and how to avoid being hospitalized. First of all, you got to find out what's going to drive them and engage them. So, And sometimes it's being in that home to figure out after the first ER visit and then the second one what's going on, you know, because the pattern repeats itself. For example, we had one patient with asthma, and the cat was sleeping on the pillow every night. You know, but until you get in the home and you see what's going on, durable medical equipment, they had an eight-foot oxygen cord. You know, and so they were taking it off on 24 oxygen throughout the day and then ending up back. And so if the patient is re- isn't reporting that back in the yard, ER, there's so many clues in the home, so many clues. Okay, well, we are just about out of time for today's web seminar. We've reached the end of the hour, but I want to thank our presenters, Glenn Euro, Kathy Ponder, for, for joining us today, as well as Aaron Albers from Home Instead for joining us for the Q&A. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank, thank you. you.